Lots of us have played the typical JRPGs like Final Fantasy or Wild Arms. They often follow a similar formula. You travel the world on a quest to stop some overwhelming evil and have to walk from place to place until that sweet day when you finally get some kind of airship, plane, or interstellar dragon. It's a pretty sweet time flying all over the world and completing fetch quests, collecting collectibles, and playing card games within a video game. But what you might not realize is that the world is hiding a deep, dark secret. And no, I don't mean something like the final boss always has at least three forms. What I mean is that your map is a lie. Well, technically the map itself isn't lying, but the game developers are misleading you by letting you think all these worlds live on a sphere because they don't. They actually live on something far more interesting. What? You might argue that, of course it's a sphere, otherwise I couldn't travel from the east half of the world and suddenly be in the west half of the world. And that's true, most of our world maps do have this property, but where the problem lies is the fact that when you go north, you also end up suddenly on the south of the world. If we look at a flat projection map of the earth where the north is the top line and the south is the bottom line, with the east to the right and the west to the left, sure, if you go towards the right side, you'll suddenly be on the left. But try as you might, if you go towards the north end, in no place will you ever come out of the south end. So what in the world is going on here? Or rather, what kind of world is going on here? Well, to understand that, we need to look a little more carefully at the differences between a projection map of a sphere, like the equirectangular map of the Earth, and the world map of a typical JRPG. On the map of Earth, if you were to exit the map north here, you would re-enter the map here at another point on the north line. Similarly for the south line of that map. This is due to the fact that the entire north line of the equirectangular projection map like this actually represents a single point, the North Pole. The south line represents the South Pole. The points along the line represent what angle you approach the North or South Pole from. However, the east and west line works as you would expect. If you exit to the east, you re-enter at the same level on the west. So, we can recover the actual shape of the equirectangular projection by rolling it up so that the east and west lines coincide and then shrinking the north and south lines down to a point. What a nice, beautiful globe of the Earth! Contrast that with a JRPG map. In a JRPG map, the east and west lines work the same way as they did on the previous map. If you exit east, you re-enter at the same height on the west and vice versa. But here, as we pointed out before, if you exit north, you re-enter at the same left-right position on the south line. This indicates that to find the true shape of this map, we could glue the north and south lines together, and then glue the east and west lines together. However, when we roll the shape to connect the north and south lines, we get a cylinder where the east and west lines are now curved, and to get them to connect in the right order, we have to now roll the entire cylinder up, and we get a donut. I mean a torus. Well, you want some? Wait a minute, are we really saying that the worlds that all these JRPGs occur on are actually Tauruses? Tauri? Whatever. Well, anyway, yes. Yes, we are. So why would a JRPG developer design a world map this way? Well, mainly I think it was a cheap and effective way to fool the player into thinking that they could traverse an entire world. They were likely counting on the fact that most gamers wouldn't know enough geometry to be able to tell that this wasn't a sphere. For example, most people know that on the globe, if you go far enough east, you'll end up coming out west, and if you go north, you'll end up wrapping around two and coming back to where you started from the south. But those same people probably wouldn't think that hard about how that should look on a projected flat map when there were monsters to fight and treasure to find in that cave over there. But that just explains why there was some freedom here on what shape to pick, not why they went for a torus specifically. To understand that, we could ask first, why didn't they just use the equirectangular projection of a sphere? Well, the main problem with that is something that you can see from our animation of the plane transforming into a sphere. To make the distances work out right, you necessarily have to stretch things at the north and south ends, so distances become distorted. And this is an effect that always happens with a flat map of a sphere because a sphere isn't flat. This would likely have been complicated to code and memory expensive, something that was a pretty limited quantity for games back then and it would have made the world look weird. On the other hand, if we look at our torus animation, it is true that the second part of the animation does stretch some distances, and so that's not an entirely faithful version of the true flat JRPG map. But it turns out that there's a slightly more complicated way to think of the torus inside of a four-dimensional space that doesn't stretch any lengths, 
and for which the 2D flat map is a completely faithful representation. This is done by taking the four coordinates of R4 and making two copies of the unit circle in R2. That is, the torus is the set of all coordinates in R4 where x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 and z squared plus w squared is also equal to 1, which is basically a Cartesian product of two circles, S1 cross S1. The neat thing is that while it may be impossible to visualize, it's actually simpler numerically and so would have been easier to code. So to summarize, what we've discussed so far is that a flat torus map likely would have been easier to code and would have looked better than a flat version of a sphere. But the question remains as to why these toroidal maps were so convincing that it made many players think that they were playing on a sphere. Heck, Final Fantasy VIII went a step further and even had a map viewer that faked a view from a sphere. Well, we've touched on one idea, and that's the fact that you can loop around east to west and north to south and get back to where you started. But the other part that makes a torus believable is an important quality that it shares with a sphere, namely that it's a manifold. In geometry and topology, a manifold is a space that looks flat in the small, that is, if you zoomed in far enough. Or more precisely, it looks like Euclidean space in the small. Spheres have this property of being a manifold, and that's why the Earth looks flat to us when we look around. Well, tori are manifolds too, so if you were a really tiny object living on the surface of a torus, the torus would look flat from your point of view as well. So ultimately, tori and spheres share some really important properties. One, if you go north, you'll loop south, and if you go east, you'll loop west, and two, they look flat on small scales. This means that if you don't think too hard about it, it's easy as a small character on a gigantic world to mistake a torus for a sphere, and the torus was way easier to program. That likely made it a pretty easy choice for early game developers. The 2D torus world map occurs less and less these days, but it still stands as an incredibly clever use of geometry and topology by early game developers to create a world that was believable and easier to code. Though it does raise some interesting questions about what the weather should be like on those toroidal planets. Of course, now that you know that all classic JRPGs occurred on donuts, it's something that you'll never be able to unsee. But as long as they're not glazed with sprinkles, it really shouldn't affect the gameplay that much. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of the geometry of a JRPG planet. If you did, please click that like button and subscribe to Scholar Sauce. We produce content like this regularly, and you don't want to miss out. If you can't get enough of this fun math stuff, you can click here for a hilarious introduction to induction, or here to see why the angle sum of a triangle might not always be 180 degrees. We'll see you next time on Scholar Sauce.